Henry would sell his soul to be the most popular kid at school and date the girl of his dreams. So when he meets a mischievous demon ready to grant his wishes for a terrible price, Henry turns him down, leads him on, and his life starts to improve anyway until the movie decides that's not how these kind of stories usually go. We watch Deal of a Lifetime today on... Oh. Savage! Is this? Hello, however you wish to self-identify, and welcome back to the... Savage! is this which used to be the podcast where we dove through dvd bins and sorted through streaming apps to find the weird the bizarre and the unloved but lately has become a podcast where we watch movies to stave off the existential dread about this grim horrifying new reality that we currently live in i'm your host kaz lesgard and joining me always is my co-host jameson rafter yeah uh, i gotta say i'm not hanging by a thread as much as you are <laughs> just I, internally I just just uh just just my sanity is hanging by a thread and i got you i got it was dangling precariously before this all happened, so, you know, business as usual, really. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So now all, like, the lingering dread has, like, a, has a focal point to it now. Something specific that you can glob onto and not just, like, you know, general actor anxiety. Yeah, I can force this off on the situation, on the virus that's currently going around. The, the virus whose name we will not mention because apparently we get demonetized if we do that. That's a weird thing. It is an odd thing, yeah. I mean, I, it, won't, it won't matter, like, in the, in the long term... Ah, well, never mind. I was gonna say it won't matter because <laughs> we're all gonna die. <laughs> yes, it won't matter in the end if we're all dead. But who cares? How you doing, Jameson? How how is your sanity uh, holding in there? My sanity is doing just fine, considering that like for eight hours out of the day, I still have a job to do. Thankfully, the uh, the video game and the tech industry marches on through all this. You know, we're all operating out of our homes, having our remote desktop meetings and everything. So that's, you know, keeping my sanity afloat. I'm also, like, working on the Bigfoot cartoon with Kevin. And during this time, like, my sister, who is a film student herself, no, sorry, an acting student, she had a final project, which was, like, a film production or a stage production or something production that she couldn't do with her fellow collaborators because now there's, like, the social distance thing going on. So she asked me to animate it. So I've been uh, busy myself with a... Uh, a third project outside of my uh, my nine to five job because you didn't have enough. Exactly. You know what? I'm I'm thankful for it. Like you know, I got eight hours a day where I got to focus on work, and then I'm either doing editing for the podcast, I'm doing the cartoon with Kevin, or I'm doing the cartoon for my sister. I really haven't had much of a time to like get into like a new show or learn a language or get into cooking or any of the other wonderful things other people are spending their time with. <laughs> How about you? I feel that too. A lot of like most of my friends are artists as well. And I see them every day releasing and producing like new stuff just for like social media. Tons of people are reading books a chapter a day and they're doing puppet shows and they're creating songs and stuff. And I was like, yeah, as a creative type myself, I'm kind of, oh man, I need to be doing more. I'm, I'm a bad artist right now, but I'm also still working. I lucked out and uh, I have a, you know, I have a nine to five still too. So, you know, I, I do that. Yeah, I don't really have time. So really doing this with you is sort of my main creative output during this. Aww. But that's also fine with me because I'm also one of those artists that enjoys creating, but what I love more than creating, what I love more than putting something out into the world is doing nothing and being unproductive. So I'm, 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 I'm in heaven. I'm currently in heaven. What we do here, it's not so much creative as it is criticism. <laughs> There's a creativity to that. Yeah, yeah. Like I couldn't make it as a as a as a screenwriter, so I'm just gonna like bring people down a peg, you know, down to my level. That's what I'm up to these days. Well, we'll see how far our creativity can stretch with today's movie, which is something that I just know nothing about. Like, so before let let's let let's get into this one now. I'm gonna pull back the curtain a little bit on this. Now, the concept of the show is that we do a, a weird, obscure movie that barely anyone has heard of, and I often like to sort of, before the episodes start up, I kind of like to play up the fact, just to sort of like set the mood, be like, oh, what's this? Oh, I, I've never heard of this before. More often than not, yeah, I I actually have heard of the movie before. Because I'm, you know... You've been lying to me this whole time? <laughs> <laughs> I've been lying to everyone. This is my conf These are my confessions. Wow, you are a good actor, Kaz. <laughs> right? But yeah, this time around... 
no fucking clue. In fact, throughout work today, I, I had to struggle to remember what the hell the name of this movie even was. So, uh, today's movie is called Deal of a Lifetime. It's a 1999 comedy? I'm not really sure. It is, from what IMDb tells me, a story about a young man who sells his soul to the devil's agent to win the love of the most beautiful girl in school. And that is all the information I could find about this movie. That's that's it. That's the one blurb. And then no one else has written anything about it. So this is one of those, like, Faustian kind of tales, like, bedazzled and, I guess, Faust. <laughs> you know, someone sells... <laughs> Well, there's, I was going to say there's Bedazzled, but then it's like, which one? Because there's the original one with, like, Peter Sellers, I think? Peter Cook and Dudley Moore. That's right, yeah. And uh, and the remake with young Brendan Fraser and Elizabeth Hurley. But it's more just, like, the trope of yeah. selling your soul to the devil, which I, I'm pretty sure, like, every cartoon from, like, 19... 19- 65 on has had an episode where some version of the devil comes to like tempt i don't know fucking fred flintstone with and then he and then he realizes oh this isn't what i wanted at all and then the, the devil is always beaten in the end yeah yeah because like they they get more than they bargained for there's like the ironic twist with the getting everything that uh, that the devil promised did we just review this movie i think so Thanks for joining us, everyone. <laughs> People have been saying our episodes are too long, anyway. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, so this will be the, well, like, the loser high schooler who sells his soul to the devil and, I guess, becomes popular for a day. It's the heart of the girl, but realizes that's not exactly what he wanted. And then he's got to foil the devil. That's uh, very, uh, I think that's pretty much what we're going to get out of this. I don't think we're going to get, like, that... That treehouse of horror sequence uh, in The Simpsons where Devil Ned Flanders takes Homer to court. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's the best one. I'm pretty sure out of all of these stories, th- that episode of Treehouse of Horror is still the best sell your soul to the devil story. Oh, yeah, yeah. Simpsons did it. So the director of this movie is Paul Levine. Whoa, Paul? Oh, no, sorry. I'm thinking of Ken Levine, the uh, the creative director of the Bioshock games. Sorry, continue. Uh, yeah, he doesn't have a, a hell of a lot of a career here. The movie he directed before deal of a lifetime it's a film called aurora operation intercept which i think is one of the worst titles for a movie i've heard in recent memory worse than my brother the pig <laughs> at least that movie told you what what it was about aurora operation intercept sounds like a ps1 game that you'd find in like a bargain bin yeah yeah the the offshoot sequel the one that was made by like a studio that didn't do the original one but got the license and then just drove that license into the ground that's right So that movie is a Lance Henriksen thriller where a Russian terrorist has the ability to remotely crash airplanes and plans to crash one into the White House. Why are we watching this movie? It sounds pretty good, right? Yeah. The only notable thing I can uh, find about that movie is that uh, the actress who plays the terrorist in that, uh, Natalia Andrechenko, is the Russian Mary Poppins. In in what way? Like, she's in, like, the Russian, like, version? Yeah. Of- yeah, no, in the sense that Russia has their own version of Mary Poppins that's not a Walt Disney version of Mary Poppins, and she's Mary Poppins in the Russian version. Oh, okay, okay. So just, you know, just picture, you know, like a, a 90s thriller where the terrorist is played by Julie Andrews. <laughs> Russian Mary Poppins sounds like a sex act. <laughs> Even the old Russian Mary Poppins. <laughs> That's where you take an umbrella and, <laughs> and a spoonful of sugar and, <laughs> <laughs> and some vodka. Oh my god. We gotta create the Russian Mary Poppins. Oh man. Oh. Once once hookup culture is back on and I have someone over to be all like, ah, I'm really into the Russian Mary Poppins. Come on, guns a blazing. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. I lost my train of thought. That was really good. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> moving on. The other movie he uh, directed um is a two thousand and two thriller called Spider's Web which stars Stephen Baldwin as a wily businessman who plots with a sultry executive to swindle $40 million from his father. But who is conning who? Ah, uh, the, the director to the audience, because <laughs> I'm sure that movie sucked. And in between that, he directed one episode of Sexy Urban Legends. What? That's an actual show? And he directed the 2001 TV movie, Personals, College Girl Seeking. So he had a bit of a softcore phase there for a bit. Yeah, so this is like Skinamax stuff, right? Probably. <laughs> Alright, well, when we're done this, I'll go look that up. Okay, good, yeah, me too. He also co-wrote the 1989 Taekwondo movie Best of the Best, 
So that seems a little presumptuous, like to title your movie Best of the Best. Particularly when uh, you realize that that movie uh, ended up having three sequels. So he was not Best of the Best. <laughs> it's the final fantasy of movies. <laughs> I bet there's, like, a lot of diminishing returns in that franchise. <laughs> Fairly so. Diminishing return. Well, when the first movie started, the star of the first movie is Eric Roberts, and then the directed DVD sequels, you can't get Eric Roberts back. Yeah, diminishing returns. Let's say that. <laughs> no one likes Eric Roberts. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure Julia Roberts likes him. Oh, I don't know. I was, I was referencing the South Park episode. There's only one answer. Nobody gives a shit about Eric Roberts. Eric Roberts. No, no, please. I never. I don't think I've ever rewatched an episode of South Park. They're, they're so topical that like I don't know if I could like really go back to just some of the. No, don't go back to. Oh, I mean, like certainly don't go back to like the early seasons of South Park when it, when they hadn't found their footing yet. If you want to go back and rewatch, I'd, I'd say like rewatch around like season three. That's around when they did the uh, Corn's super groovy ghost mystery. <laughs> That's a good one. So this movie, what I, I have to deal of a lifetime. I have to keep looking back to the top of the page here because I keep, I keep forgetting what this movie is called. Uh, <laughs> it was written by Catherine Sloan who wrote deal of a lifetime. And that's it. All right. <laughs> Moving on. Let's meet the cast. A real grab bag of people uh, you, uh, I, w- I wouldn't say famous people, but definitely people that you might have remembered from other things in this. The uh, the big above the title star for this movie is Mr. Kevin Pollock. Yeah, um, from Usual Suspects and uh, End of Days and... Uh, a few uh, Good Men. A few Good Men, yeah. he's uh, He's been in a ton of shit like throughout the 90s and 2000s. Always playing kind of the same guy, kind of like the wise ass. Yeah, for those uh, keeping score at home, he's the Kevin who does impressions and was in Usual Suspects that we don't hate. <laughs> right, yeah. Think, and just think, think people at home listening too. He's like, anytime you're like, you're down on yourself, uh, you know, about like the, where your life is going, or, like maybe, maybe you tried some things that didn't work out too well for you. Just remember, there was a point in time. When sad Kevin Pollock was saying to himself, man, I can't believe I'm the second best Kevin who does impressions and was in Usual Suspects. Just give it time. Give it time. Look at him now. Top of the world. <laughs> one of them went on to be quite memorable and one not so much. But for the wrong reasons. But for the wrong reasons, yes. All right. Starring as Henry, we have an actor named Michael Gorgian. He played Bob in SLC Punk. Have you seen that movie? I have not. Yeah, that's a movie that I remember in like my early 20s working at a video store. Everyone told me I should watch that. And I had a roommate who was really into that. And she watched that all the time. Never seen SLC Punk. Never seen Uh, it. Don't have an opinion on it. He was also skittery. In Newsies. Haven't seen that either. No, I haven't seen that either. It's not... Someone out there was going like, oh, wow, all right, cool. <laughs> this is about the point where I'm missing having a guest on our show. <laughs> so we could probably talk to you about some shit and fill in the blanks for us. He also wrote and directed a movie called Illusion, which was the last film of legendary actor Kirk Douglas. Whoa, really? So that's a little... That's a, that's a, that's kind of a big thing. Also, Brian Cranston is in that movie. Oh, cool. Maybe we should do that movie one of these days we're just gonna have like a list of you know what let's see let's see how good this movie is first before we commit to something like that i have a feeling we're gonna by the end of this we're gonna have a list of movies that we should have done other than this one you already mentioned one off the bat that sounded much better the the russian spy lady who could crash planes with her mind i will try to find that one yeah starring as tina is jennifer rubin she played Terran in Nightmare on Elm Street 3. Oh, okay. All right. Now, do you remember Nightmare 3? That was the Dream Warriors. Right. That was the crazy one, but also kind of like the most fun. And uh, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like nice. some of them, because like the kids had like superpowers and shit, right? They had superpowers. Yes. So, yeah. so Jennifer Rubin is character. So when they're all getting powers at the end, uh, there's like the, the one kid who's all like, oh, I, I, I'm a wizard. And the other one's like, oh, I'm super strong. Jennifer Rubin's character is the one who comes out and she has a big ass mohawk and her power is in my dreams I'm beautiful and bad 
and then she pulls out like a switchblade. The baddest power of them all. <laughs> uh, playing the role of Foster, we have Esteban Powell, who played Carl, who was the blonde freshman kid from Dazed and Confused. Oh, okay. I haven't seen that either, but it's on my Netflix must-watch list, so I'll just Oh, see. Dazed and Confused is one of my favorite movies. You gotta watch that. You gotta bump that up to the top of the queue. All right, cool, yep. Yeah, that's um, Matthew McConaughey and... Uh, Matthew McConaughey, Ben Affleck, uh, La- yeah. Mila Jovovich's first movie, and she has one line, and she ended up on the poster. Save that one for uh, for Monday, for April the 20th. Perfect. <laughs> oh, for 20, baby. <laughs> right around the corner. I'll tell you one thing, and this is like a little inside baseball for our listeners, but in Vancouver, there used to be a lot of 420 celebrations at the uh, the beach close to uh, to where I live. And so when I would be home all day, and then like in April, it, gets, it starts getting really hot in Vancouver, so I would leave my balcony door open while I was at work. When I would come home, my place would just reek of weed <laughs> that would just like sift in through the... Uh... Smoke travels up, yeah, yeah. and you are on a top floor. So you just never bought it, and you just got like a contact high? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Not going to happen this year. No, no. This is the year of hot boxing. <laughs> All right, rounding out the cast, as Lori, we have Shiri Appleby, who was the star of uh, two TV shows that uh, I've never heard of before, uh, Roswell. Oh, right. That was like... It was like Aliens in High School. Yeah, yeah. It, that was, wasn't that like sort of like a sister show or a companion piece of Smallville back in the day? Yeah. Was it? I have no idea. Yeah, no. no. But no, she was the star of that, and she was also the star of some show called Unreal. So... Someone out there knows who who this is, so this is why I mention it now. Now, when we were looking at our list of movies to watch for this episode, you said, I think we should do Deal of a Lifetime, and now I have to ask, why did you want to do Deal of a Lifetime? (laughs) This, like, we sounds like we have nothing to do. We're getting nothing from these cast members. Well, we will once we watch the movie, presumably. We won't know. All right, almost on the cast list. As Kevin, uh, we have Eli Craig, who's not really an actor, but he's notable because he wrote and directed a movie I really like called Tucker and Dale vs. Evil. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great movie. Great movie. My uh, my buddy uh, Adam Bouchain is in that. He's uh, he's the first to die. He's the first to die. He's the dude that gets uh, impaled on the, the big tree. Oh, cool, cool. And finally, rounding out the cast as Mr. Creighton, we have Ron Glass, a.k.a. Shepard Book from Firefly. Fly. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Yeah. And what else? No, that's it. <laughs> okay. Oh, no, he's, pro- oh, he, oh, he's probably been in other things, but that's the main one, right? Yeah, yeah. Once you're known yeah. for, like, one thing, you don't need to list the other shit that you've been in. Yeah, he can just coast on, like, con appearances, or at least he could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a thing that we used to have. God, remember Comic-Con? I meant more that Ron Glass died in 2016. Not that all the fan conventions have stopped. But no matter how you slice it, that joke was in bad taste. On with the show. Remember uh, mo- remember movie theaters? I, I remember, trying to remember, like, just outside in general. <laughs> I have, like, been, like, kind of sequestered in my apartment for the last little while. Well, that's not, uh, that's not gonna change. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and it's not your fault. Why am I bringing that up to you? <laughs> it might be. It might be. No, it's my own damn fault that I'm inside. Oh, you mean your um your your leg? Oh no, I thought you meant like the general atmosphere of what's going on. But it's like, is he, is he blaming me for COVID? Oh god. Oh thank Wait, god. What have you eaten in the last three months? <laughs> Was it a bat? I haven't. I haven't had bat in years. You can't get good bat anymore. <laughs> And now you can't get bad at all anymore. Actually, sadly, that's not true. Anyway, let's go watch Deal of a Lifetime. And uh, yeah, maybe yeah, when we come back, we'll have more shit to actually talk about. <laughs> Stay tuned, everybody. More Deal of a Lifetime after this. Sorry, I had to say that because, like, Deal of a Lifetime sounds like a game show. It sounds exactly like a game show. If we had thought, maybe if we had thought a little bit more about this, we could have done, like, a game show parody. But we're not that type of podcast. We thought. Whoa, look at Mr. High Production Value over here. We don't plan this shit out. All right. We're back. Um, back from the afterlife. Oh, God damn. That movie, that movie is fucking garbage. That movie was fucking terrible. Don't recommend. End of episode. Oh, you know. Jesus like, Christ. This is this is one of those cases where it's like, as I was watching this early on, I thought to myself, this is going to make for a good episode discussion. God 
Damn! Holy fuck! I mean, we watch a lot of bad movies on this show. Like, that's kind of part, part and parcel of what we do here. It's the charm, it's our point. Only once before have we watched a movie that is straight up incompetent that doesn't know doesn't seem to know how movies work and then literally for the last 10 minutes i just i couldn't take notes anymore my jaw was just dropped i was so lost the last like the last 10 minutes of this movie are so confusing and it what it smells of but it was but also really revealing because i think what the last 10 minutes of this movie revealed was that at one point in time there was more to this movie this this movie has been hacked to pieces yeah it's already like an hour and a half long and it feels like there was maybe like half an hour's worth of more material removed from the movie. I don't know if it was for like, like a cut, like edited for TV. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Did it just not work? Did a producer have a look at it and say like, Oh, this is running too long. It like, no, people are going to walk out of this movie. You got to shave half an hour off this movie somehow. So they removed like maybe three or two like integral like, subplots to this movie. But they cut out all of the scenes that make the movie make sense. <laughs> I like, I like to imagine what you were saying. Like they're in the editing room and then like someone is saying it's all like oh this movie's way too long we need to, to cut uh, some of this out how long has this movie been running for and someone goes like this movie's been running for 20 minutes I'm like fuck <laughs> did i direct this fuck oh my god <laughs> oh god like like who's responsible for this because right i'll just say it feels like a kevin pollock vanity project <laughs> to a degree man kevin pollock <laughs> is trying and kevin pollack can be very funny he he can be both a very talented dramatic actor and he can also be hysterically funny his stand-up is very good he's been funny in other things in the past but you can only do so much with certain material and they're giving him nothing and the result is an astoundingly unfunny performance i don't know you thought that he was unfunny i thought like i thought he came out the gate really funny i guess but it's such it's such a tired cliche of a character it, it's just like it's exa- it's the devil's agent and he's like oh he's like oh i'm a, I'm a, I'm a fast talking uh, slick huckster kind of character yeah like like hades from hercules cut type you know like unscrupulous and uh mean-spirited to everybody and sassy in all the right ways and there were some parts where i thought like oh he's he's enjoying his screen time on this and then parts where, like you were saying, he's getting really grating. <laughs> and like, I, I just, it dawned on me that like, this is the first time I've seen a, a movie character where I liked them and then I hated them and then I liked them again and then I hated them again. Hating that, I found them annoying. And then, oh, but like, he's going to save this one scene and then he's going to ruin this other scene, you know? Before we get into the plot, name to me a scene with Kevin Pollock in this movie that you enjoyed? Uh, his early stuff when he, when the first we knew about him, he was just like an unscrupulous agent of the devil and he's being dismissive to his assistants and... Okay, but what did he say or do that you thought was enjoyable? That made for a good movie character? I don't, I can't... Uh... My mind is mush now. After having experienced that whole movie, I wish I wrote something down because I started out liking this guy, and then like the more he got, he went on, he got a little grating. We we may as well just talk about like the fucking movie because <laughs> I can't Let's cite anything by this. example. Let's talk about the movie. I have very I have very few nice things to say about deal of the sent deal of the deal of a lifetime. I still can't remember the name of the movie that we just watched. <laughs> Deal of, I have to write it on every page of my notes so I remember what it's called. Deal of a Lifetime. Okay, Deal of a Lifetime opens very confusingly over the opening credits. What was going on over the opening credits, Jameson? What was that, what was that effect? Oh, like that really wavy looking through like water or glass effect? Yeah! I thought eventually, I mean, like, when you see that, so the opening credits pop up, and then there's something going on in the background, like we're looking through, like, a fish tank or something, and I thought, uh, you know, I saw that, I'm like, oh, okay, this is, like, the slow build over the credits, eventually this will pan out, and we'll see what the full picture is. It never did. It just kind of stopped doing that after a while. Yeah, to reveal that we were in this movie's depiction of hell, which is depicted as, like, a refinery? <laughs> like a like a textile factory, or... Well, yeah. Is it... I don't, I, now, I don't think 
this location is hell. I think there is a hell. This is more of where the devil's, I guess, workforce lives. And it's hard to tell if it's on a different plane of existence or yeah. if, or, or if it's just like, downtown or something it's very it, everything's very badly defined in this movie and it's hard to yeah there are mentions of purgatory heaven does exist in this movie though which we will we will absolutely get to oh my god yeah so our main character uh is henry who is the atypical high school nerd you know he's a little dork he, he has no confidence he's got a crush on uh the you know the cute girl who who is uh dating the 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 popular jock and the plot plot of the movie begins very casually when one day, when he's in the lunch line with his uh, buddy Foster, he says to himself... His angsty friend Foster. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. He just like conversationally happens to mention... I swear to God, I would sell my soul to go with Lori Pittman. Normally, the whole sell your soul to the devil plotline, the stakes are a little higher than this. There's a, there, There's a lot more writing on <laughs> that that make that would make a character push themselves to the brink of saying I would give up my immortal soul should I believe in that you know yeah. like, uh, but clearly we are we are characters yeah. in a movie yeah. so but all of this happens so quickly and so early like this happens in within like the first 2 minutes of the movie we 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 don't have any backstory yet for Henry we don't we we can ascertain by looking at him that he's like the loser in high school but there's no scenes there's no scenes of him failing at things before he makes the claim that oh I'd sell my soul for that it's all like you need to give us a little bit more than that movie yeah I never got the impression that he was unpopular he just wasn't part of the popular crowd he wasn't yeah. uh, he wasn't like a school pariah or anything he was just another student in this movie. That much we know. So yeah, so Henry just happens to say, you know, just just in passing, that he would sell his soul for a date with this one girl. And then we cut to, like, what? We cut to Kevin Pollock's movie. Because <laughs> this is Kevin Pollock's movie. <laughs> so we cut to Kevin Pollock's office. And Kevin Pollock is Jerry Lazarus, who is an agent of the devil. We get the idea that there's more than one agent of the devil but he but he is like uh like a hotshot agent of the devil who's due he's like the top agent but like he's due for like another win because he lost a, re a contract recently and there's got to be a soul for a soul kind of deal or whatever and his his boss bob which i assume is for bielza bob that's the puns we're working with that that's the subtle humor that we're dealing with in this movie he says i want henry Stoner. this little weenie which is never like elaborated on. No, for <laughs> for that matter, this is yet another movie we're covering where there are kids, where there are youths. We never see their parents. Yeah, the closest Henry has to like another family member is his little sister, um, who is probably part of a cut subplot. Okay, yeah, no, we gotta we. I really want to talk about this little sister who is not an important character in the movie, but I was going to talk about her at this point, but then the ending of the movie happened, so I'm I'm going to save that for later yeah, because little, it's not going to make any sense if I talk about it now. Like, like we may as well just like recap the plot, and then as the events show up, we got to discuss it because the, that's how we that's how we experience this fucking movie. Yeah. So yeah. so Bob the Satan tells Jerry that he's got to get Henry's soul because apparently this is this is a really important soul that he's got to get. And what else? So, and Jerry has he, has, he has two secretaries. One of them isn't important, but the other one is, uh, what's her name? Uh, Tina. Was it like a doomed soul? And uh, I guess Jerry tricked her into being his secretary, which I guess is better than burning in hell, but she's still really sad, but. She, she's uh, she's upset and she hates working for him because he's a, he's an asshole. And yeah, she's like looking for a way out, but you know, she's indentured to him at this point. So whatever. So Jerry goes to the mortal world and he just, he follows Henry around and entices him with like, Hey, sell your soul to me and I will, I will give you your wild desires. All you gotta do is, like, sign the dotted line, give me your mortal soul. I think in any other movie with this premise, that would just sort of go off without a hitch. Henry sticks to his guns and tells him no, and Jerry seems to go through this fucking extended trial period 
where he shows him what his life would be like and kind of gives Henry everything that he wants without him like agreeing to give away his soul just yet. This is, I won't get into specifics because if I do, this will be jumping ahead a bunch, but what is fundamentally flawed about just the structure of this movie is the fact that, okay, so so Jerry shows up, he, he tells Henry, hey, if you sell your soul to me, then I will make all of your dreams come true and everything that you want will happen. And Henry says no. And so Jerry does it anyway. And Henry becomes popular and gets everything he wants. And then Jerry later on is all like, hey, you know, like some of your soul. And Henry goes, no, I don't want to. And then Jerry doesn't take anything away. He just keeps making more inconveniences happen for him until Henry eventually decides to sell his soul. God, it's, no. I need a, uh, I need like a chart. I need, I need like a whiteboard to figure this out because it really, really to map it out. Yeah. More than anything, Jerry seems like a guardian angel for Henry, just like magically allowing good things to happen in his life. But at a cost. Like Jerry always wants something in which he wants he wants the soul in right. Re- right but henry doesn't agree to give him his soul jerry just lets all this stuff happen apropos of nothing and his confidence builds because of it and says like eventually he even just tells jerry point blank hey thanks for all your help or everything i'm probably not gonna go ahead and give you my soul i'm not gonna like ask for everything i've ever wanted in my life i feel pretty good about where i where my station is at right now so thanks for helping me out here man i'm gonna i'm not gonna sell you my soul but thanks for helping me out what makes this all so confusing is that it feels like if there had just been one scene where henry said i'm not gonna sell you my soul and then kevin pollock's all like cool i'll just turn back time and go back like two days before I gave you everything and made you super popular and then I'll just make you like a loser again and then he does that and then Henry realizes oh I actually enjoyed being you know popular and everything uh you know like hey Mr. Satan come back and then and then Jerry comes back and then he does it again then that would make sense that's not in the movie or is it that's what's fucking me up right now because (sighs) All right, can we just... Ugh, blah, blah. I, don't, I don't know where to attack this movie from because I think we just need to, like, point out individual weird shit that happens here. Yeah, so Jerry begins, like, his uh, demonic trial period for Henry in the uh, the theater class where he... Gets... Well, no, he begins in the cafeteria. What does he do in the cafeteria? Well, okay, see, this is more evidence to support the fact that this movie was hacked to pieces in the editing bay because we go to Jerry in his office being told by... Bob the devil that he's got to get this soul smash cut to them in the cafeteria and Kevin Pollack is dressed up the lunch lady. If you've wanted to see a movie where Kevin Pollack wears a variety of elaborate wacky outfits, deal of a lifetime is the movie for you because yeah. he, he's got like 80 costume changes in this. It would have made, it would have been more appropriate if this were an animated feature because like this is essentially like a, he's essentially Daffy Duck. Like he puts on a variety he, he's a cheerleader at one point. He's a football player. He's Peter Pan at one point. He's James Bond. But he never inhabits the role like a Robin Williams genie. He shows up in these costumes and there's always this air of, uh, it's never like, I'm a cheerleader. Rah, rah, go Henry, do this. Oh, like, now I'm a theater actor. Oh, I'm doing this. It's always just Kevin Pollock nonplussed in these, in, in these outfits, just kind of going like, yeah, I'm, I'm in this movie. Yeah, I'm Kevin Pollock. Yeah, Kevin Pollock is not giving any shits in this movie at all. Early on, when he goes down to meet Bob, the devil, the, de- the devil's all like, We had such high hopes for you, Jerry. I don't see any recourse but the boiler room. And Kevin Pollock's line delivery. Oh, no, sir, please, not the boiler room. Oh, I'll do anything. Give me a second chance, please. Please, Bob, no, please, no, not that, anything but that. Like, he couldn't give less of a shit of being in this movie. And yet, like, I think he enjoys, like, hamming it up in, like, these elaborate costumes. I He seemed to have a blast doing it. I think maybe he was just, like, talking to a door, I think he felt was wasted on his talent. I think maybe what happened is every once in a while he's in a costume and he seems engaged and happy. That was clearly from the beginning of the shoot. And then as the shoot went on, he realized what movie he was in. 
and then his attitude sort of wanes more and more. You know what? He probably heard about the cuts that gave his character like a, some emotional depth because it keeps like go, cutting to, or it keeps mentioning. They, they do. They introduce her own ethics subplot for him that goes nowhere. Yeah, they mention this contract of a woman that he was interested in that he burned up and saved her from a life of damnation, and that's why he's he needs to collect this other soul. But they never really delve on that that much, and I feel like maybe at one point they did. And he enjoyed those scenes because they got to show off that he was more than just a comedic ham. There was some depth to his performance. And uh, now with that on the cutting room floor, he just got jaded and bitter. And, you know, decided, well, uh, this is as good as I'm going to act when I'm acting opposite a door. <laughs> I kept writing in my notes, how did Jerry's powers work? The movie wants us to think that he's like Mr. Mix's Plick. Yeah, that's a good reference and also good pronunciation. I don't know if I'd be able to bust out... The proper pronunciation. Oh, what, of Mr. Mixius book? Or? I think I, no, I did it once, and that's a good. <laughs> I applaud your nerd cred. Now, the real question is, can you say it backwards? Kill tip season. <laughs> but that, that's it. Now I, now I can't do it for 90 days. <laughs> and then Jameson disappeared from the podcast. Yeah, oh god, I wish. <laughs> But yeah, so like Mr. Mixius Pitlick or whatever the fuck his name is, he snaps his finger and like magic happens. Subtle magic happens. Well, it'll be subtle magic or or subdued magic. But uh, yeah, yeah so- stuff happens because like he'll appear out of nowhere in a goofy costume, snap his fingers, and reality will have been warped somehow. Yeah, and it's always badly defined and a, a lot like... Uh, it's reminding me of another movie that we reviewed, but I can't remember what it is right now. But it's like who... The movie doesn't determine how this magic affects other people. Oh, underdogs. That was, that's what it was reminding me of. Right. Uh, in yeah, the sense, yeah, in the yeah. sense that, so like, he's the cab, Jerry shows up, he's the cafeteria lady, and he's all like, I can make your dreams come true, baby. And then like, instead of like the gross lunch that everyone else gets, he snaps his fingers and he gets a rotisserie chicken on like a silver tray. And then Henry like walks away, walks away to the table. So can everyone see that? Or is that like, did he just get the same gross lunch and it just like looks that way? Or did he actually get that? I think like the like the movie shows it has to show us the audience that it's Jerry in disguise. I am sure that his, like, in the movie logic, he appears however he wants to appear to everybody else. There's a scene in, like, high school gymnasium where he's, like, a student with a nose ring, and he rallies the students around uh, nominating Henry for school president, and everyone does, and he's like, that's not even a student! <laughs> yeah! So does he look like a student to everyone else? These are just things that we just have to assume. Yeah, because the movie doesn't explain it to us. All right. So we, we got to go back to like discussing this plot a little bit. Though. Now, okay, here's my, here's my question to you, Jameson. Do we? Do we need to go back to explaining the plot of this movie? Or can we just sum it up briefly here and for the rest of the podcast, bring up the questions that we have about this movie? Because I feel like if we do both of those things, this will be a three-hour podcast, and I have a lot of questions about this movie. But Well, before we do that, I think it's at least important to talk about the scene outside the gymnasium on the high school dance the first time it happens, because... It does happen again, all right? Okay, so Henry has already gotten a small sample of Jerry's powers. He still hasn't agreed to sell his soul or anything. Outside of the school, uh, at the school dance, a couple of things happen in quick succession. We meet the uh, the school bullies who are all dressed in awesome early 2000s, late 90s getup. I don't know. I didn't see too many school... I, I went to school at this time. I didn't see too many bullies wearing, like, sweet leopard print and fucking jean jackets. No, no one did, but that's what, like, every TV show uh, of that time, that's what everyone wore. And that's what that's why they would have you believe. Yeah, this was like a fucking old Navy catalog. But anyways, instead of beating them up, they say like, hey, Henry, we're on your side. We're not going to beat you up. We got to stick together because we've known each other forever. Again, <laughs> if we had a scene that established the bullies early on in the movie, this, like the turn of, hey, we're not bullies anymore, Henry. Hey, we're buddies and everything like that. That would mean something but yeah. this is the first scene we're seeing the bullies so it again it just it, they're just more characters all right the other thing that happens is henry and foster they see like their their love interests like they're the pretty girls that they're too shy to ask out and uh, well okay i just want to so yeah foster has a crush on a girl as well too and she's played by an incredibly attractive young actress, but because she has glasses, everyone else is all like, because her name is Peggy, and then everyone's all like, oh, it, oh, it's Piggy instead of Peggy, and she has a last name that rhymes with loser. Yeah, it, her name is like Peggy... Peggy Doozer. And everyone goes, oh, Piggy Loser, and it's like, she's a smoking hot girl, what are you talking about? Anyway, <laughs> the drama teacher goes to them and says, oh, you should ask them to dance, and they say, oh, we don't dance. 
and then the drama teacher takes it upon himself to lead Peggy Doozer in like this waltz set to music that Jerry puts on, this ballroom dance music. We and guess? I- 1999 was a very different time when faculty members could just go to school dances and just dance with the students. It's not even the dance floor! It wasn't even the dance! The dance was inside the school! This was like, this was like the smoke pit that they were dancing around. <laughs> Fucking, yeah. Okay. Shepard Book plays the drama teacher who seemingly is the only teacher at this school because <laughs> he's in any scene that requires a teacher or an authority figure he's the only one there he seems to be like a drama history teacher because they don't do any acting they just write papers on Shakespeare which I mean, like I went to theater school we did that that was a class but yeah it seems but yeah he also leads the assemblies and chaperones the dance and yeah he seems to do everything, everything. at this school we don't see another fact we do see one other faculty member we see the coach yeah no you wanted to talk about this the the, the, the so coach. this is really interesting so the coach is played by George Wallace Peter comedian George Wallace. George Wallace who's popped up in funny another uh, the only other movie that's coming to my another hell movie he was in little nicky yeah. the reason i didn't bring him up and meet the cast is because this movie I, I said at the beginning of this episode like there is so little known about this movie imdb has the wrong george wallace credited for this movie <laughs> so you were looking so let me guess you were doing some research for this, and you saw the cast list, and you're like, oh, George Wallace. Like, oh, wait, it's not that George Wallace. There's another George Wallace. Never mind. And then it was that George Wallace. Yeah, I noted it, because it's like, oh, George Wallace. And no, no, they have um the George Wallace that they've credited for this movie uh, is a white actor who was in the classic B-movie Forbidden Planet. Oh, sweet. And was also in something called Radar Men from the Moon. Mm-hmm. And he has 231 acting credits. So, yeah. He's an impressive George Wallace. He's just not the George Wallace that's in this movie. And I feel like someone on IMDb really dropped the fucking ball. They, like, maybe, like, maybe, like, George Wallace who's in this movie, like, noticed that they've credited him wrong. And he just said to himself, you know what? I'm not going to correct them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to let this one go. When they put when they put my name on IMDb, can you make sure that it's attributed to the other guy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let the other guy have this one, yeah. I don't want anything to do with this. <laughs> this is so funny. I'm so glad. Yeah, because you texted me, whoa, George Wallace, and I'm all like, what? Wait, that's the wrong guy. <laughs> incompetent. This movie's incompetent. All right, now that we kind of got that out of the way, do we really want to talk more about the plots? Like, eventually... Henry does sell his soul to uh, to Jerry. Yeah, he sells his soul to Jerry, and then he realizes, oh, that was the wrong thing to do, and his friend gets hurt. I mean, God, we could go into the specifics of this, but it's all just so asinine. I'd honestly rather just talk about the weird shit that happened in this movie. Sure. We may get to the ending eventually. But... Like, spoilers, Henry doesn't go to hell. <laughs> Jerry ends up punished for his, in a really weird, that's, okay, let's talk about this. Okay, I have a, I have a list of bullet points of things that I want to talk about but let's talk about this so when jerry keeps failing over the course of this movie to get henry's soul bob the devil keeps doing things to him in stages so we see like like uh, jerry's trying to get the soul and then he fails and henry walks away and then when we cut back to him he has a red bow tie on and that has appeared magically and then he goes no bob not the bow tie bob, bob please i just need a little more time Okay, what's going on here? And then a few scenes later, the same thing happens when he cuts back. He's got nerd glasses on. It's all like, ah, the glasses too. And I'm like, is what is he do? Is he turning him into a dork? What's going on? And then eventually, I guess we find out that there are like lower level demon accountants that and that's that's Jerry's ultimate fate. He ends up as one of like the loser demons, but. I don't understand why the magic bow tie and glasses had to be part of the ensemble. Just to give him, like, a consistent look so you could recognize him. Didn't you pick up on, like, the nerd underlings in, like, like the opening shot and the opening credits? I noticed they were there. I didn't notice that they all were wearing the same outfit. Wow. Did you notice that it was completely inconsistent as to when he was wearing the bow tie and the glasses? Because he switches costumes so often. Sometimes, so, like, I guess there's just, like, his regular Jerry costume that has the bow tie and the glasses now, but then he'll, like, 
change into the stoner kid and he's running around and he's doing things and he doesn't have the bow tie and the glasses on and then they'll come back and I'm like, oh, I guess when he has costumes on, he doesn't have to wear the bow tie. But then later on, he dresses up as a football player. He's got the glasses and the bow tie. So it's t- completely inconsistent. Yeah, and then when he has to dress as like the fashionista or the uh, the cheerleader woman, like that bow tie is now a scarf. Yeah, he accessorizes given the situation. I didn't understand that. I didn't understand the ice cream truck. That was that was confusing. So Jerry shows up with an ice cream. I did like it though because yeah, he he. Uh, that's just another one of the cookie cutter scenes where he goes to Henry and says like, "Hey, how you enjoying your trial period? You gonna sell me your soul yet?" And he's like, "No, I'm probably not gonna do it. I, I'm not cool with that." And then like because it's an ice cream truck, two little kids go up and ask for ice cream, and he says, "Ah, uh, all we got are uh, Tabasco flavored." Tabasco swirl. It's every all the kids are liking it. Yeah. Again, okay. So like my two questions are a like the tray of food how is so this is like a magical ice cream truck that jerry can conjure to show henry but then it looks like an ice cream truck to the other kids if if jerry's magical though why can he just he could conjure anything why can he why does he just conjure gross ice cream he could conjure anything he wants he could conjure a beast from hell to come and scare the two children away but this is the best that he can do is just be all like, look, ice cream, but it's not very tasty, so fuck off. I, yeah, I don't I don't really care so much about that because that scene ends with him just chucking rocks at these kids, which I loved. That's a that's a good way to end any scene. I don't care. <laughs> They're like, Well but it's not even it's it's not even that. The kids are all like, Do you have any other ice cream? And he reaches into again this magical truck that he has conjured out of nothing that he could conceivably grab anything out of. What does he grab out of it? A metal bucket that has, like, pebbles. Like, like grits and... <laughs> or rock salt in it. And he just kind of half-heartedly throws, like, a handful at the kids and they kind of run away. And that's the I end of that like scene. It. Why do you want anything more than that? You're tampering with diamonds with this scene, Kaz. Like... <laughs> Here's a thought I had while watching the movie. Here's a thought that I that I jotted down. So this movie came out the same year that End of Days came out, which Kevin Pollack is also in. And in right, yeah. and in that movie, he dies and then Satan brings him back and he betrays his friend Arnold Schwarzenegger and then dies again and then Satan presumably takes him down to hell. Is that what happened to his character? Yes, let's say. Let's say that, that uh, End of Days and uh, Deal of a Lifetime all kind of t- intertwine and take place. Why else would he make two hell-based movies in the same year if he if he didn't want to create a, a deeper narrative going on there? It's the Kellen Pollock demonic cinematic universe. That's what we got going on here. Um, so Henry is now running for school president. Uh, against the former, like, popular jock who now doesn't have his girlfriend because the girlfriend is really liking Henry because he's a nice guy. He's not concerned about popularity. And Foster's girlfriend, Peggy. And so bullies who are now, have now befriended Henry are going around vandal, on his behalf, going around vandalizing Peggy's uh, campaign posters and this causes the falling out between him and Foster. Yeah, and Foster also isn't really the sharpest tool in the shed either. There there was a moment that kind of made me stop and go, fucking what? So, yes, So Foster and Henry are hanging out, and then, like, things are kind of tenuous between the two of them. And then the bullies come over... And they're all like, alright, Henry, we gotta talk about, like, your campaign and stuff. And yeah, screw that, that Peggy girl. And then they come up with the Piggy Loser nickname. And that's what makes Foster upset and he walks away in a huff. And then we see Kevin Pollock running around defacing all of the posters and writing the, the name, the, the Piggy Loser name on the posters that the bullies just came up with. So, in the next scene, Peggy is all upset, and she's crying, and she's all like, who would deface my posters? And Foster just kind of sits there and just goes like, man, I don't know. Really? You don't know? You You don't even have, like, an inkling about who maybe could have done You were just there! They came up with the name, and then they high-fived... Because they were so proud of what a good name they came up with. You were so upset, you walked away in a huff. You have no clue. You were there when the bullies hatched the plan. Did you think that there was going to be a reveal? Because they keep saying that Kevin the jock, who's dating the girl that Henry likes... 
they keep saying over and over again, it, on top of being, you know, like the captain of the football team and being the super popular guy that everyone likes, he also is getting like straight A's in all of his classes. Did you think there was going to be a reveal that he was really paying smart. someone else to do that for him? Because that never came. You know, I got the impression just from like the movie that we saw and there could have been some cut scenes that like the movie wants us to imply that he... He was genuinely a nice guy. Well, yeah, that's the thing, because early on, the, the first time we go to the dance, there's like a fight between... There's not a fight. He's a he's he's goofing off with his two friends, and then Lori, Lori yells at him. He says, Freddy, and then he shrugs to his friends, and she storms I off. I know, I wrote down, why is she mad at him? Like, genuinely, why is she mad at him? Did we miss, did we miss a scene? Yes, we clearly did. We missed many scenes that explain these things yeah i feel like if you're gonna go all out with the cliches like this movie does you know you've already made him the captain of the football team turn him into a jerk and give us a reason why the girl would want to leave him and end up with henry he seems fine he we he doesn't do anything over the course of the, he's barely a character he has maybe five lines that i can remember and none of them are like oh, screw you you're you're a dummy or something yeah no he's he's fine but yeah like throughout all the uh, posters getting defaced and uh henry gets kissed by a cheerleader right yeah so at one point when um when jerry's trying to get back at henry for welching on like their deal that they didn't make he's at henry's at football practice and football team don't act as his uh, lineback defense and he gets tackled by the other guys at practice this wasn't part of Jer like jerry didn't do anything to manipulate events to have that happen that was just like a fucking prank that the the other players were playing on on henry and i'd also go as far as to say that what happens after that jerry didn't manipulate either because yeah he, he henry gets tackled and he he breaks his arm and his arm's in a sling and the next time we see him like every girl in the school is fawning on him do you ever have any injuries in high school no i I've had an injury in the last month, and I can tell you, women are not all upon me at the moment, I, can, I assure you. I mean, you're also not in a situation where other women or people are currently, but yeah, you know, yeah, it's that classic trope of like, oh, I'm in high school and I hurt my arm. All of a sudden, every girl loves me and is fawning over me. Let's, fuck it, let's just talk about the ending of the movie now, because I have a feeling the ending of the movie... Well, no, I, I, we gotta follow the course of the plot here. So, at at, um, at the debate... I don't, I don't want... This is generally the first time I don't want to talk about the movie that we just watched, because it sucks. All right, you go. So, Jerry steals the presidential debate speech from Peggy, and he gives it to, to Henry. And at the presidential debate, Henry starts to read it, and Peggy realizes that it's her speech, she stole it, she storms off, and that was the last straw. And now Henry wants to welch on his selling of his soul to uh, Jerry, but they have a contract, there's no backing out of it now, and so Henry just goes through with it, and I guess presumably become, becomes school president and becomes miserable? <laughs> <laughs> we, well, we don't know, because they go back in time before that fucking happens, but like, yeah... But the way Henry, okay, so the way Henry gets out of his eternal damnation is Tina, Jerry's secretary, who's the woman from Nightmare on Elm Street 3, she, so she broke into Jerry's safe that had all of his uh, secret files in it, and she finds, so inside Jerry's safe, they find not only her contract, not only, not only Tina's contract that Jerry has been holding which is the only thing that's stopping her from passing on and going to heaven. But she also finds a love letter from the woman that Jerry helped get out of hell because he had the hots for her. I'm assuming Jerry kept as a memento because it's covered in perfume and I guess he's still in love with her or whatever. So Tina does this sort of gambit where Jerry comes back and she has a folder and she's all like, I got your love letter in here and I'm going to send it to the devil. And then Jerry snaps his fingers, sets it on fire. But surprise, it was Henry's contract. So he hand delivers the uh, the envelope full of the ashes to, to Bob. And then he just slumps over. <laughs> and, yeah, and Christ, <laughs> that was when he gave up on that movie. <laughs> He just slumps over half-heartedly, and that's a wrap on Kevin Pollock. But there is one more scene where we see him in his nerd glasses. He's all like, nah, this isn't enjoyable, but it's all like, I really just wanted the movie. I kind of just wanted the movie to end there. Just with, like, Kevin Pollock just, like, swamping off, like, off camera. It was so anticlimactic when, like, the reveal... Because, like, Bob spends his entire time in the movie just behind a door. We never see him. We presume he's, like, this hulking, large, beastly... Satan! But he's, he's, he, 
he's just a he's just a door with some fog machine smoke coming through the mail slot. He's behind the door, Jameson. Obviously, but like when the reveal comes that oh, here's the contract you wanted, boss. Oh, this is full of ash. You failed me yet again, you numbskull. But so I thought, well, like, is that it? Is that how this fucking movie resolves itself? Uh, but no, it's not. <laughs> The next 10 minutes are amazing. <laughs> so, yeah, so Kevin Pollock realizes he's been duped. He slumps down uh, out of camera. And then after that scene is over, the movie loses its fucking mind. <laughs> okay, so to explain what happens... Okay, as I was saying earlier, if there had been one scene where Jerry said to Henry, Look, you don't want any of this popularity... That's fine. I'll snap my fingers. We'll go back a couple of days. None of this ever happened, and you're the same person you were back before I showed up, and I made you the deal. If there was that, and they had introduced this idea of time travel before the movie started, the ending might make sense. Instead, after Jerry fails, we, we it goes. It presumably goes it, back in time. It goes back to the beginning. It goes to the very first scene in the movie, which is the little sister waking him up with, like, some silly string just being a bratty little sister and Henry exclaims wait a minute you hate me of course dummy what do you think you hate me again Two things about that. One, that exclamation would make one think that there are scenes in, like, the middle of this movie where the little sister now likes Henry. Yeah, has, like, a hero worship for him and won't leave him alone or whatever, yeah. Helping him with stuff like that. That never happens. The little sister has one more, one other scene in this movie and she's helping him like i guess get, get pick out clothes for his date but she's being a little shit to him the entire time you can't go on a date with Lori Peller looking like this i can't you are so far off the geek community. you're giving me a nosebleed Ugh. you need some new clothes <sighs> yeah she the little sister character is in three scenes of this movie and two of them are exactly the same <laughs> And this is what is fucking wild. In, like, the first two minutes of this movie, the movie opens with this scene of the little sister sneaking into his room and then, yeah. like, spraying silly string in his face. And then he wakes up and goes, Wait a minute, you hate me. Yeah, it's like if A Christmas Carol opened with, What day is it? Oh, it's Christmas Day! There's no other explanation for that. The editor of this movie fucked up. We've seen movies with bad editing. This is the first time we've seen a movie where the editor genuinely fucked up. And he fucked up in the first scene of the movie. You put one of the last scenes at the start in the opening credits before we establish any of these characters without even knowing if this... The Little Sister's not even a prominent character in the fucking movie. So, like, I think what they were... What their plan was, open with the scene with the Little Sister being an asshole and being all like, huh, this is my life. Can you believe it? Established in the first scene that the Little Sister is a little shit. And then when things start going great for him, you need to have a scene where the little sister is, like, worshipping him and fawning over him. And then, at the end, you can have the scene where he's all like, wait, you hate me again? This is amazing. But you could, comp if there was, like, a time issue with this movie, you could cut the little sister scenes and lose nothing. <laughs> nothing is gained from having a little sister in this movie. They only needed three scenes for this character. And not only did they not film two of the scenes that they needed, but they reused the last scene that they did, and they put it at the beginning, and they thought no one would notice. But we noticed, deal of a lifetime. We noticed, and we're fucking calling you out for it. So, so like, we just relive that scene that I recapped earlier. He's in the theater class, and instead of, like, getting a passing grade, he doesn't, and, like, he congratulates the, the popular kid on getting the, the straight A's. But we don't know that this is going on, because there's, in, like, a Jimmy Stewart moment where he's all like, oh, I'm back! Everything's... Everything's Everything's the same and everything's terrible. Hooray! It's just he goes to school and we, as the audience, assume that everything that happened to him over the course of the movie has already, has still happened. But it's very clear that, no, we've gone back two days. Somehow. For yeah. some reason. And then my favorite part happens again in the, the, like, the smoke pit outside the dance hall. So... 
I originally thought that the reason that the drama teacher and Peggy led that ballroom dance was because Jerry snapped his fingers and that caused like the magical ballroom music to play and they just started waltzing in front of everybody. With Jerry not around, that still fucking happens. <laughs> What music? What music are they dancing to? I don't know. They're still waltzing around to it. Is it like? Is the music? Because the music? No, no, it's it's fucking like Sixpence None the Richer or one of those other fucking bands from from the early two thousands, late night. Hardcore fucking name drop. They're fucking Sixpence None the Richer. Why did Toad and the Wet Sprocket not immediately come here by? <laughs> Get some fucking Seven Mary Three in here. God damn. The rest of this podcast is just listing 90s bands. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, and then, yeah, and then the rest of the movie is just this scene that we've already seen. But and longer. barely, but longer, and barely anything is different. It plays out almost exactly the same way. The difference is that, that Foster and Henry decide to like, oh, we're going to dance with the girls after all. Like, they show up, like, they say to Ron Glass, like, hey, man, I... May I cut in? And, uh, <laughs> and it's all like, please do. I uh, I touched this uh, underage student and we started dancing. And as soon as I realized uh, that, I realized uh, that was a, a big problem and I shouldn't have done that. So please, yes, let's cut in and, and get me out of this situation before yeah. I get, immediately get fired. And 1999 like, was a different time. And then Lori, who like at this time has stormed off away from her boyfriend, she comes across oh, the people sense. dancing. Yeah, the boyfriend even says like, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> But uh, she locks eyes with Henry across the way. You know, in this timeline, this is a guy who earlier in the day had like a weird outburst in drama class. And now she's got the hots for him and they have a slow dance in the middle of the concourse. That everyone, and yeah, so these two couples are in like the middle of the quad, not even like at the dance. They're just like dancing they're slow dancing in the middle of the quad to presumably no music. And then there are just all of these other students just watching them. Just watching these two couple. No one else joins in. It's just these two couples. And everyone else is all like, oh, that looks nice. Oh, they look nice. And all this is like intercut with the scenes in, of like the afterlife where Tina has snuck past through the lobby of like a fucking train station. <laughs> it was like a high-end office building. It was like that they got for a, they found like this high-end office building that they went like location scouting and then it's all like, hey, maybe we can use this in the movie. It's all like, no, we don't really have any scenes that take place in an office, but hey, maybe it's the afterlife. So they just had like a lot of people in suits like walk down an escalator and in, in through like a like just a door frame <laughs> and uh, she walks past that to get to a fountain staircase case where she's waiting for St. Peter. Who is the only time I laughed in the movie. Not the reveal because St. Peter comes down. St. Peter's a little kid in shorts, which which in itself isn't funny, but just his line delivery. So yeah, Tina walks up to him and goes, So what do you think? Can I get out of here now? And he just goes, Yes. <laughs> I don't know why that made me fucking laugh like crazy. Just that kid's line delivery of that. Because once again, they grabbed a kid. Didn't grab a kid who could act very well. Yeah, no, you're you're right. Like I, I laughed my head off of that line too because like there were so many questions that I had watching that scene, and I'm like, shit. Like, are we gonna get some answers here? <laughs> Well, we did. <laughs> and yet several more questions. So Tina ascends the uh, the staircase up the water fountain into the light, into heaven, and the movie ends. Yeah, and, and it ends with uh, the end for now. As yeah. if that, as, as if they're like no, taunting. That, no, that's, I think that's, this is definitively the end. There isn't going to be more of them. Further misadventures of Jerry the Agent Demon. All right, is there anything that we didn't talk about? Do you want, want to talk about Kevin Pollock dressed up as a salad? <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I burst out laughing in that scene because there was a very emotionally heavy, mo two emotionally heavy moments that bookend that scene. There's a scene where Henry kind of has like a, a bit of a tiff with Foster about like the nature of popularity. Because like Foster's whole thing is that like people peak in high school and shit. And like, you don't want to be that. You want to be the guy who peaks later in life. And, you know, Henry says, oh, I, I, I disagree with you, friend. And, you know, they, they kind of storm off and have a, there's a divide there. Like, oh, these, these two best buddies. I hope things can patch up. Cut to Kevin Pollock bursting out of a salad trough dressed in army fatigues, yelling at students. Cut to Henry and uh, Lori having like a real heart to heart chat about like how her boyfriend doesn't understand him and like Henry thinks that she can do better and deserves better and she's a kind soul and whatever. Those are two like emotionally heavy tools in this movie, but in between them, there's just a shot of a man bursting out of a salad. You could say they really uh, tossed 
that scene in there. Is this why you wanted me to bring it up? <laughs> they, uh, they just needed a scene to, uh, break the, uh, iceberg. You got one more in you? <laughs> Let us move <laughs> on. <laughs> I had to get some, I had to get, I have to get some sort of fuck. I, this is how terrible this movie, I'm writing my own jokes so I can laugh at how terrible they are because it's better than it. There's some really good, stupid attempts at comedy in the dialogue in this movie. I, I wrote down some of my absolute favorite lines here. At one point, George Wallace asked Henry to try for the football team and he says, Do you love your school, Henry? No. <laughs> The only I the only line I wrote down that kind kind of gave me a little chuckle just more more it was more of like a relatable oh they're these kind of high school losers is they go to the dance and they don't bother to attempt to dance with anyone and then they kind of just like stand on the fringes of the dance and then without doing anything or interacting with anyone they just kind of like look over and, and one of them says I'm about ready to go back to my house and have a little cereal eating session. And I'm like, <laughs> At one point, uh, Lori says something to Henry, something nice to him, and then like a bird chirps. <laughs> and Henry says, thank you, birds. Thank you, birds. Thank you, birds! Thank you, birds! <laughs> All right. Thank you, birds. Thank you for your service. <laughs> well, remarkably, we've spent an hour talking about this movie. Is there? Yeah. Might as well wrap this up. So, would you recommend Deal of a Lifetime? You know what? I kind of do. I don't know why. I think it's just so weird and so stupid. I mean, like, it's it was hard enough for us to try to describe this movie. I encourage other people to check it out for themselves. Because, like, we... I don't think we did it justice. This is one of the rare times we disagree. No, don't watch this. I don't... I do not recommend you spend your time watching Deal of a Lifetime. I think there are a multitude of, of better movies you can watch. There are better... There are better movies involving Satan and Kevin Pollock that you could watch instead of this one. And yes, I just called End of Days a good movie. That's... That's what this movie has done to me. I'm surprised you didn't like uh, Kevin Pollock. I thought you would have uh, appreciated, like, him uh, chewing the scenery and like having a variety of like oh. i like kevin pollock i like the concept of the trickster character who wears a variety of disguises i didn't like him in this movie i didn't think he was funny i didn't I think, think maybe that's what it is i did enjoy most of his performance and you didn't and since he's in this movie a fucking lot yeah like that's probably where the split is <laughs> i guess what i'll say is watch 10 minutes of this movie and if you can stomach what Kevin Pollack is doing, keep watching because it doesn't get any better than the first 10 minutes of this yeah. movie. It's just more and, of like, the same. Yeah. yeah, 10 minutes is a good barometer because, like, after that, it gets fucking weird. Yeah. Very bad. This was a badly made movie by... <laughs> Agreed. Agree with you there. <laughs> Actually, here's a question. Would you watch a, an extended version of this where a lot of the, like, the some of the scenes that were cut out were put back in? Yeah, if they could dig up where the fuck they buried that, but I'm fairly certain those are lost to time. George Wallace probably bought them all up and burned them. <laughs> I, I know we've mentioned this before, but I cannot get over the fact that the first scene of the movie is a mistake. <laughs> I genuinely cannot think of another movie I've seen where that has happened. That blows my mind. Seriously, if you're taking a hacksaw out of this fucking movie, you could remove all the parts that have the sister in it. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, you mentioned you're working a lot right now, but yeah, is there, is there anything you recommend people uh, check out? Uh, uh, I was on uh, my friend Hannah Snyder's uh, podcast called Keeping It Straight with Georgia. No one named Georgia is on the show. It's just a, uh, it's a local uh, show of, like, takes place of, like, between Vancouver and Victoria because uh, Hannah travels back and forth to do them all the time. And it just goes over, like, the art scene and uh, the theater scene and the music scene of uh, Vancouver and Victoria. Uh, the episode I'm on heavily deals with the um, the global pandemic that whose name shall not be mentioned. So it's I'll, I'll eventually get back on that show. I'll, we'll get you on the show with me, or like just you on the shows, because like you have your finger on the button of like the theater scene more so than I do. You asked if I wanted to join you on on the show, and when I was listening to your episode, I'm like, man, I'm really glad I didn't. I'm really glad I had someone else to do because they really get into politics on this episode. And I'm like, I would have been like, Ugh, I have no opinion. But we'll get a, we'll get on the show again, and we'll have like a we'll have a talk about our like respective podcasts and uh, we'll get her on this show when 
uh, hopefully when all this blows over. Yeah, so uh, check out uh, Keeping It Straight with Georgia. Oh, and one thing that I do want to plug is um, uh, I recently watched that uh, Saturday Night Live at Home uh, special that all the cast members did. And, you know, it was like, it was a unique episode of Saturday Night Live. And, you know, they're all at home. It's not like your typical... Was it just called Saturday Night? Was it live? Was it a live show? No, not really. It was a lot. I mean, I'm sure they recorded it live and they sent the best takes, but it was like edited. But I thought it was very... I, I got to tip my hat to those guys for, for pulling something like that off. And during the opening credits, so I welled up just a little bit because here is like a longstanding institution that's, that's keeping going, you know? It was really nice to see them do something like that during this time. Yeah. And there were some good sketches there. My personal favorite was like the dating show that took place during a quarantine. That's a, that's a good bit. And uh, nice to see that they're following in our footsteps of <laughs> continuing to put to put out work for the masses. You got to laugh. You got to laugh in these in these times. Uh what are you what are you up to these days? I want to recommend a really good movie that I saw the other day. Polar opposite of the movie we we just watched. Uh I watched a really fantastic movie. It was called 1985. It's a black and white queer movie. It is about a young closeted gay man in 1985 who goes home during Christmas to see his family who are uh, hyper-religious. And it's just a couple days uh, in his life. Uh, he hangs out with a friend. He he runs into his high school bully who's working at the grocery store, and he apologizes for making fun of him, and he gives him a pie to apologize. It's a really good uh, slice-of-life movie. You can kind of tell where it's going, given the, the time frame and what was happening to gay people, you know, the, the other pandemic that was happening uh, at that time. But it's a beautiful film. I came across it uh, because, I, I think I've talked to you about this, uh, I have a real love-hate relationship relationship with the TV show Gotham. Yes. Well, well I didn't I wasn't expecting that, but okay. okay. There are uh there there are three actors who are in Gotham that are that are in this TV show. Uh the main actor is Corey Michael Smith who plays the Riddler and he's phenomenal. The acting is so good in this. Michael Chiklis plays his dad. Okay, wow. So good. What a what a oh just a a very different role for him. Very soft spoken, very subtle. Virginia Madsen plays his mom and she's lovely. Jamie Chung plays like his his uh, high school friend. If you just want to watch a really good movie, watch 1985. That was really cool. good. It was the best movie I saw this week because the only other movies I watched this week were I went back and I rewatched the uh, the Star Wars prequels. You want to hear my hot take on the Star Wars prequels? Still bad. Yeah. All right. So uh, yeah, I guess uh, I guess that's it. Next episode, Jameson. Oh, it's that time of the year again, baby. WrestleMania. WrestleMania. We we have gone one full circle around the globe, and we are we are about to do our our second go around of our first ever theme a month. That's how long we've been doing this. It's time for round two of WrestleMania. It, it feels like it. Well, I mean, the last couple of weeks have felt like a year, but <laughs> yeah, it's 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 been a year, and we're gonna. We're going to do some dives on some uh, some wrestler-themed movies. You found a couple over uh, Tubi, have you? I found a couple, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about what, what movies we'll do. Yeah, not not the not the WrestleMania that I would have um, I would have hoped for. I, I would have hoped for guests, obviously, but uh, yeah. we got to... We got to get Scott back to finish that other Hogan movie. <laughs> we'll see. But, uh, yeah, yeah, WrestleMania coming up uh, next time. And uh, yeah, I guess uh, just uh, stay tuned, everyone. Stay inside, stay safe, and... Uh, Stay safe, um, look out for each other, and, uh, yeah. And as always, like I say, constantly, you stay frosty, Deputy Dogs. I haven't said it the past couple of times. I gotta remember my catchphrases, otherwise it's not gonna make <laughs> It's not your catchphrase. You took it from Mr. Stitch. That's Mr. Stitch's catchphrase. That's what we do. We do the movies that no one's ever heard of, and then I take the catchphrases, and I claim them as my own, because no one's seen the movie, so no one can really call me on it. And then if I need someone... And they're like, wait a minute, that's from Mr. Stitch. And then you run. <laughs> I either run or I fall in love. <laughs> All right, I'm stopping recording now. Okay, bye everybody. Bye, <laughs>